First, Major General William K. Gaylor, Army Aviation Branch Chief and the Commanding General, United States Army Aviation Center of Excellence. Chief Warrant Officer 4, retired Robert Joe Monette, escorted by Hall of Fame member, Major General Retired Thomas W. Garrett. Colonel retired Jeffrey N. Williams, escorted by Hall of Fame member, Chief Warrant Officer 5, Edmund W. Ned Hubbard III. <laughs> Lieutenant General retired Kevin W. Mangum, escorted by Hall of Fame member, Command Sergeant Major retired Buford Thomas, Jr. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Chairman of the Hall of Fame Board of Trustees, Chief Warrant Officer 5, retired Randy W. Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of the colors. Please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Miss Candace Pimpkin and 11 year old Mayor Waits. Please remain standing for the retirement of the colors by the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment Airborne Honor Guard.
Okay, if you would, remain standing again. I'm going to ask Sonny to come up and do our invocation for tonight's service. We do have a special guest with us tonight as well. We have Congressman Green. He should be at the head table, I think, tonight. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Sonny. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. <clears throat> From the rising of the sun till the going down of the same, let the name of the Lord be praised. Bow and pray with me, would you? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this gathering. Very special time to salute three great soldiers. Mr. Rob Monet, Colonel Jeff Williams, and Lieutenant General Kevin Mangum. For lives of service, Lord, they are three men who answered the Isaiah 6 call where you said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And they each said, here, my Lord, send me. Use me. And God, you did use them in a great way. And we're grateful for the difference they made in our army. Lord, I just thank you tonight for, uh, for the opportunity you gave them and for the strength you gave them. Thank you for the support that was provided by their family and their friends and their comrades. And so, Lord, we're grateful that they've run the good race, they have fought the good fight, they have made a difference for God and for their country. And we salute them tonight. Lord, tonight we are grieved for what's going on in Paris tonight. And so we do remember that great religious center and people there. And we pray that out of ashes, Beauty will come. Lord, thank you again tonight for your presence in our lives. We love you. Thank you for this Army Aviation family. And Father, we remember the scripture that says, the eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. We pray our prayer with the blessing on our food in the Savior's name, amen. Thank you, Sonny. Honored guests, Hall of Fame inductees, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame 26th induction ceremony. Please charge your glasses for a toast. Here's to our inductees, our armed forces everywhere, particularly those deployed tonight and their families. All our past, present, future warriors who protect freedom worldwide. Hear, hear. Hear, hear. Please be seated and enjoy your dinner. And watch the screens, the fine sponsors that have helped make this night possible. Our program will resume in about one hour. Chief Warrant Officer 5 retired, Randy W. Jones. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I certainly hope you enjoyed your dinner as much as I. Tonight, we celebrate the 46th anniversary of the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame is a real hall located at Fort Rucker, Alabama, where portraits and citations of the inductees document their very valuable contributions to Army aviation. Tonight, three individuals will join our Hall of Fame. These individuals have made an indelible impact on our branch and indeed upon organic Army Aviation itself since its inception 77 years ago on June 6, 1942. Counting our new inductees, there are only 172 people that have been inducted. These people represent a broad spectrum of our community, including 107 officers, 32 warrant officers, 21 enlisted, nine aviation industry individuals, and three government employees. 19 of our inductees or Medal of Honor recipients. And I would mention to you that those of you that don't know, our Cub Club members, which number 10 in January, numbers were reduced to nine when Lieutenant Colonel retired Chuck Kettles passed away. He was a Medal of Honor recipient as well, and we'll certainly miss him. Please keep his family in your prayers. <clears throat> Are there any other Medal of Honor uh, recipients present with us tonight? Not. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you the President of the Army Aviation Association of America, Brigadier General Retired Stephen D. Munt. And if you would, with all members of the trustees of the Hall of Fame, please stand and be recognized. And joining them, all members who have been inducted in the Hall of Fame, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Before we begin this evening's in introductions, please welcome again the Commanding General of the United States Army Aviation Center of Excellence, Major General William K. Gaylor and his wife, Michelle. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> General Gaylor, if you would, join us on the stage. <clears throat> and now it is my privilege to begin the Army Aviation Hall of Fame 26th induction ceremony. Our Master of Ceremonies this evening has earned numerous awards for his work in television. He has produced, written, and hosted scores of documentary programs on the history of military aviation and our country's efforts in space. As a panel moderator, he joined astronauts Neil Armstrong, Jim Lovell, Gene Cernan on three more morale-boosting trips to visit our troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the aircraft carriers we had located in the Northern Arabian Sea. He served three years active duty as an officer in the United States Air Force Strategic Air Command, and he's provided the voiceover for our inductees videos for the past six years, all on his own time. He served as our Master of Ceremonies since 2017 when he was inducted as a Knight of the Honorable Order of St. Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, please a hearty welcome for Mr. David Harton. Thank you, Randy. Good evening, everybody. All of you on active duty and all of you veterans raised your hands, some of you more than once, and swore to support and defend our Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to defend and fight for the unique freedoms that we are privileged to enjoy as Americans, and your families, through each of you, made the very same commitments to our country. I am honored just to be in the room with all of you tonight. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Now it's time for our, thank you. Our first inductee tonight is Chief Warrant Officer 4, retired, Robert Joe Manette, from the battlefields of Vietnam, where he earned numerous decorations for valor, to heading up the Aviation Systems Command Test and Acceptance Team, CW4 retired Buffalo Bob Manette, has made an indelible impact on Army aviation. As you will see in just a couple of moments on the screen, he is also one incredibly lucky man. Please direct your attention to the screens. Chief Warrant Officer 4, retired, Robert Bob Monette, was born in 1947 in Mount Vernon, Ohio. He attended Ohio State University and joined the Army in 1968. He graduated from Warrant Officer Candidate Flight School in September 1969 and requested and received immediate assignment to Vietnam. He arrived there in late October. He operated in the Republic of Vietnam's two core area and in other countries supporting the U.S. Army 5th Special Forces. 
In mid-July 1970, after hundreds of missions, often sleeping on the deck of his Huey, he was sent back to the States and assigned to an air traffic control company. Bob realized this was not his calling, so he volunteered for a Cobra transition and returned to Vietnam in mid-March 1972. Bob was flying a Huey on 18 April 1972, performing visual reconnaissance west of Lai K when he and his crew spotted a C-130 descending out of the clouds with its right wing on fire. Without waiting for permission, Bob and his crew flew through a barrage of fire to the downed and burning aircraft. As Cobras provided covering fire, Bob maneuvered his Huey closer and closer to the now exploding aircraft, and he and his crew got the entire C-130 crew safely aboard the Huey. His Huey had been hit nine times, was low on fuel, but he managed to fly his precious cargo back to base. During the entire war, this was the only C-130 crew that survived after being shot down. Ironically, Bob and his crew were not awarded the Silver Star for this rescue until 2017, 45 years to the day after it took place. On 3 December 1972, flying Cobras again, Bob's wingman was hit by an SA-7 missile. While following his wingman down to the flaming crash site and in the midst of intense enemy fire, this time Bob provided accurate and deadly covering fire while another helicopter extracted the surviving crew members. During his Vietnam combat service, Bob estimates that approximately 15 SA-7s were shot his way. On 31 December 1972, one of them finally found its mark, hitting his main rotor system, but failed to detonate. Once again, Bob was somehow still able to survive and fly back to base. He earned the coveted Broken Wing Award in the process. Mission after mission like these continued for Bob until the Vietnam War ceased fire in January of 1973. In all, during his two tours in Vietnam, Bob flew over 600 combat missions, totaling 1,600 combat hours. Most importantly, Bob points out that during this entire time, his mother wrote him a letter every day and sent a box of cookies every week. Bob returned from Vietnam and continued to serve with excellence in various capacities. In 1984, in Korea, as 8th Army Standardization Instructor Pilot for Cobras, he started the night vision goggle program for both the U.S. and Korean armies. In 1985, he started flying the AH-64 Apache, and from 1986 to 1991, as Aviation Systems Command Team Chief, he led the testing and fielding of AH-64 combat mission simulators. In 1988, he was named Quad A Army Aviation Trainer of the Year. In 1990, he led the way in early simulator networking and presented a paper at the Royal Aeronautical Society in London on that subject. Retiring from military service in 1991, Bob has continued to work simulation training for warfighters, improving many products and programs. From his start in U.S. Army aviation to now owning his own consulting company, Bob has served Army aviation and Army aviation soldiers for over 50 years, earning the respect, trust, and admiration of the entire community warrior, trainer, and one of the luckiest men you will ever meet, please welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame, CW4 retired, Robert J. Monette. And with Buffalo Bob. And joining Buffalo Bob, his Hall of Fame escort, Major General retired Tom W. Garrett.
Yes, Mr. Hartman, I am one lucky man. Distinguished guests, and to me that includes every active retired military aviator and crew in this crowd. Quite a national, the Hall of Fame board, friends, family. I special thanks to Janice Arena for putting up with me in all my needs and requirements. I stand here before you to humbly accept this honor, an honor that I never imagined that would be bestowed on me, but I have always respected. I share this honor with my family of Army aviation that is always in my heart, an honor that I share with that all that I served with then and now, and to those who've made the ultimate sacrifice, especially the 11 on my first tour and nine on my second tour. I never really thought that my four dots would align with the celestial uh, stars of the evening, both uh, in astronauts and general officers. But in my 50th year in Army aviation, I continue to be surprised. I'm surprised that a hotel like this can serve such a fantastic meal that's actually hot. <laughs> I am very pleased that General Garrett uh, accepted my kind offer to escort me. He and I flew in through the gates of hell every day on missions into Anlock and thumbed our noses at the Grim Reaper. Another surprising thing, and many of you will share this, is Randy Jones reading off a teleprompter. <laughs> but I'm here, really am honored to receive this award. I am, am so lucky in my business that I get to go back to our mother Rucker. I go to our museum. I always go in and, and, and honor those that have fallen into the memorial area. I always go into the Hall of Fame and I'm so lucky to have known many, many, many of the individuals in there, both serving with them and for them, all Army heroes. I, uh, as our orator last year said, he said, the great David Hartman, he said, uh, you might wish to consider replacing the personal pronoun I with the first person plural we and when you do that and you say it correctly, we then turn the we into a team. I am here because I've always been a member of a great team, a team that's been successful. Been in many then and now, but tonight I'd like to honor just a few. Team Dan and Debbie, Dan a Vietnam vet, been on my team for nearly 60 years. Team Revere. Jeff, Kibum, Joe, Andy. We recently installed a, a freshwater rinse system in, in the Middle East, and, and I'm glad and proud to be a member of your team. Team Joint Aviation Command out of the UAE, thank you for allowing me to help and assist you. Team Northern Alabama Chapter of the Vietnam Helicopter Pilots. We are a unique selection of different flying types of aircraft at different times, but we come together as a unit to pull our Charlie model helicopter around and talk to people about Army aviation, safety, and teamwork, what it takes. Team AVT and the uh, central chapter of, of Army aviation out of Orlando, Florida, thank you so very much for taking the time to write my, up my award. I appreciate it. I've been a member of your team for a long, long time. Thank you very much. Team F Troop 9th Cavs, stand up. Stand up. <laughs> you guys, we flew the Battle of Anlock, the longest battle in Vietnam. We flew into 23 millimeter, 37 millimeter, 51 cals, and SA-7s every day. We again thumbed our noses at the Grim Reaper, and we 
did that as a team. And as it said, one has never lived till they've almost died. Life has a flavor the protected will never know. You have given me a flavor for life that can't be written, expressed, or said. I love you. And as Joe Galloway said, you are God's own lunatics, and I guess I'm one of them. So, but the most important team in my life is my bride, Judy, and my daughter, Shelly. Words cannot. Words cannot express how much I love you, what you've done for me to get me to where I am. You've always been beside me. The only times you've been behind me is when you give me a boot in the butt. You, many, many, many times you've led the way. Thank you. So as I depart the stage, I want each and every one of the active crew members out there to realize that you are with our hearts and minds every time you defeat the law of gravity. You are my brothers and my sisters now and forever and above the best. Thank you. <laughs> and to help Mr. Manette celebrate uh, with him, his wife Judith, his daughter Shelley Cody, and her husband Colonel Courtney Cody, many close friends with them at several tables and F Troop comrades. Would you all stand please and be recognized? Friends of Monette. May I go on? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Our next inductee, Colonel retired Jeffrey Nels Williams, beginning as an Aero Scout after he graduated from West Point, joining the elite ranks of astronauts for more than two decades, both in and out of uniform, and with almost one and a half cumulative years in space, Colonel retired Jeff Williams has taken the high ground in more ways than one. Please direct your attention back to the screen. Born and raised in northern Wisconsin, Colonel Jeff Williams began his Army career graduating from the U.S. Military Academy in 1980. After completing flight school the next year, he served with the 3rd Armored Division's 503rd Aviation Battalion stationed in West Germany. During the subsequent decade, Williams received master's degrees in both aeronautical engineering and national security and strategic studies. He also attended the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School, graduating number one in his class in 1993. From 1993 to 1995, Major Williams was an experimental test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base, becoming division chief and lead experimental test pilot for the OH-58D Kiowa Warrior. Williams was selected by NASA to join the 1996 class of astronauts, and since then, his career with NASA has encompassed the design, assembly, and operations of the International Space Station, ISS. Jeff first flew into space for 10 days in May 2000 on the third shuttle mission to the ISS then under construction, helping transport and install more than 5,000 pounds of equipment and supplies. During that flight, Jeff made a spacewalk, an EVA, lasting nearly seven hours. Subsequently, asked to focus on ISS long-duration expeditionary flight operations, Jeff accomplished three six-month deployments to the orbital outpost. With 50 trips to Russia, totaling more than five years' time there, now fluent in the Russian language, he is the only American to fly three times on the Soyuz, launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in central Kazakhstan. His first expedition 
in 2006 occurred about halfway through ISS assembly. Then, on his second six-month stay in 2009-2010, he helped complete the assembly of the orbiting station. His last expedition in 2016 saw the ISS, now bigger than a football field, in its full operational phase. In all, Jeff made his five spacewalks in both Russian and U.S. suits for a total of more than 32 hours. He commanded the station on two occasions, in 2010 and 2016, and has shared the spaceflight experience with 58 different individuals from eight different countries. At the time of his return to Earth in September 2016, Colonel Williams held the U.S. spaceflight duration record of 534 days with more than 8,500 orbits around the planet. His exploration has not been limited to space. In the midst of his duties as an astronaut in July 2002, Jeff spent nine days as crew commander saturation diving from an undersea habitat in a coral reef off the coast of Florida for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Retiring from Army active duty in 2007, after more than 27 years, and converting to NASA civil service, Colonel Williams continues his work as an active astronaut at NASA's Johnson Space Center. He is the Assistant Director for Operations for the Flight Operations Directorate, which includes the Astronaut Corps, Flight Directors, Flight Controllers and Mission Operations, Training Operations, and Aircraft Flight Operations. For his decades of excellence in academics, flight tests, space, and undersea exploration, please welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame Colonel Retired Jeffrey N. Williams. And he is joined with his Hall of Fame escort, Chief Warrant Officer 5, Ned Hubbard. Well, this is an overwhelming honor. I uh, get the opportunity over the years to speak to, to different groups. I speak to a lot of young people, and I always try to tell them when I get the opportunity to do that, to, that as they grow up and they go through life, they're going to be influenced by a lot of people, and to recognize that influence, uh, and to take the opportunity to thank the people that influenced them and inspired them in life, and encouraged them and maybe corrected them when they strayed off the path uh, to acknowledge them and, and reach out and thank them. Uh, and this is um, in a, a very overwhelming way uh, uh, a time when I need to do that. I, I can't acknowledge everybody that's here. I've been, I was surprised even as we walked in uh, with some folks that surprised me with their presence. Uh, but in the room here I have lots of folks that have uh, influenced me in different chapters all the way from growing up as a kid in high school to the days at West Point, uh, both uh, classmates as well as uh, mentors there at West Point, uh, and then of course in later uh, military assignments, early Army assignments um, in Germany, later in the test pilot business. Uh, Ned here was, uh, and I were classmates at test pilot school, and uh, he's been a great friend uh, ever since, and I appreciate his support. Uh, to make uh, uh, to bring us here tonight, under these circumstances, uh, General Bob Stewart's in the in the crowd. He uh, was the first Army astronaut, and just to, as to illustrate how we impact people, 
he was selected in 1978 by NASA to become the first Army astronaut. I was a cadet at West Point. Um, and Mike Nelson and Tom Raines are here. They were mentors at West Point on the staff there. They got me to, to get out to Stewart Field there and, and uh, see uh, Bob and, uh, and visit the T-38. And when my parents passed away, and by the way, my father was a great influence on me in that, I, and, and, and I'm listing a few people just as examples to show my gratitude. After my parents passed away, we discovered a picture in the, in the homestead uh, of me in my cadet uniform leaning into that T-38 cockpit that Bob Stewart had flown up there to give us a talk. And, and it, was, it was at that time uh, that I set it as a goal to, uh, to do what I have done for the last 22 years. So that's just an example of um, the many people, a sampling that, that uh, I want to express my appreciation to. Of course, uh, I want to express my appreciation especially to my family, to my wife, Anna Marie, of uh, over 38 years now, my partner for 40 years. Uh, thank her for her support. Um, as uh, using a quote from her, it's not easy to endure uh, the time when your husband is deployed off the planet, as she would like to say. Um, so I, I just want to express my gratitude to, to uh, all those folks that represent the, the, the not only you that are present here, but many others that that uh, have that I that I owe a debt of gratitude to. Um, now, as was stated, I joined NASA in 1996 in this job, so that was before 9/11. So I would never uh, pass up the opportunity in a setting like this uh, to thank you all, everybody in this room, for the sacrifices that you've made uh, in this war on terror that continues today. Uh, when I was orbiting uh, the planet in that tin can for months at a time, if I ever felt susceptible to feel sorry for myself, because even that place can get old after a while, uh, we flew over the war zone, or one of the war zones, or all the war zones every day, uh, and I took those opportunities to, uh, to look out the window and remember all of you and those that you represent that uh, have sacrificed so much for our freedoms that we too often take for granted. Again, thank you for this great honor. And joining Colonel Williams to uh, celebrate tonight, his wife Anna Marie, grandson Braden Williams, and many close friends with them at several tables. And would you all stand please and be recognized. Our final inductee, inductee, that is, this evening, Lieutenant General, retired, Kevin Wayne Mangum. From the cockpit to some of the highest levels of Special Ops Aviation Command, Lieutenant General Kevin Mangum has been continuously at the forefront of groundbreaking mission accomplishment and operational innovation. As a senior leader, he has helped the Army identify key gaps and chart the path ahead for decades to come. And perhaps most important, though, is how he has achieved the personal goal that all of us can envy. Please, back to the big screen. Lieutenant General Kevin W. Mangum was born on October 6, 1959, in Newport News, Virginia. An Army brat and son of an Army aviator, he grew up wanting to be just like his dad. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point in 1982. He completed flight training at Fort Rucker in 1983 and first served in South Korea. The key event in General Mangum's Army aviation career was being accepted into Task Force 160, the Night Stalkers, in July of 1984. Next, 
He served in the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault from 1988 to 1990, and then as an electronic warfare combat analyst at Kelly Air Force Base, deploying to operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Following graduation from the Army Command and General Staff College in 1993, he rejoined the Night Stalkers, where he served another five years as a company commander and battalion operations officer. After commanding a battalion in South Korea, he returned to Fort Campbell in 2000, assuming command of the 1st Battalion, 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Airborne. In that capacity, 38 days after 9-11, Kevin was the air mission commander for the longest helicopter assault in the history of Army aviation, 13 hours into Afghanistan. From the USS Kitty Hawk, Kevin commanded 12 helicopters into enemy territory under zero illumination into some of the harshest terrain in the world. Precisely infiltrating an elite combat force, the operation eliminated numerous Taliban and Al-Qaeda personnel and seized valuable intelligence. On multiple subsequent occasions in the early months of the war in Afghanistan, Kevin and his team again and again accomplished missions on what he terms the ragged edge of the force's capability. Kevin next served as the deputy commander of the Aviation Tactics Evaluation Group, planning and leading complex special operations missions of the highest national importance around the world. In the summer of 2005, Kevin returned to the 160th as its regimental commander. During his three years in command, elements of the regiment were continuously deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan, and often in many, many other countries. During his tenure, the Night Stalkers flew more than 4,500 combat missions, proving that it was not only the largest and most complex aviation unit in the Army, but was also the most agile, flexible, and precise aviation force on the battlefield. Also during this time, Kevin led significant special operations aviation modernization efforts, fielding the MH-47G Chinook, preparing to field the MH-60M Black Hawk, and establishing the 160th 4th Battalion. In the summer of 2008, Kevin was promoted to Brigadier General and was assigned as the senior commander at Fort Drum, New York. Next, he served as the Commanding General, Iraq National Counterterrorism Force Transition Team, Operation Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn. In 2010 and 2011, Kevin helped create the U.S. Army Special Operations Aviation Command and became its first Commanding General. Promoted to Major General in 2012, he became Army Aviation Branch Chief and Commanding General of the Army Aviation Center of Excellence and Fort Rucker, Alabama. The architect of a major reorganization of Army Aviation, he helped propel it to new standards of excellence. His next and final assignment after promotion to Lieutenant General was as Deputy Commanding General, Chief of Staff of Training and Doctrine Command at Langley Eustis. In 2015, he was asked by the Chief of Staff of the Army to lead the Holistic Army Aviation Task Force, an effort that will shape the future of Army aviation for decades to come. After a military career of 35 years, Kevin Mangum retired in 2017. Lieutenant General retired Mangum's bravery, selfless devotion to duty, and exceptional leadership have proven that his boyhood ambition to follow in his father's footsteps was the right one indeed. Please welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame, Lieutenant General Retired Kevin W. Mangum. And General Mangum's Hall of Fame escort, Command Sergeant Major, retired.
Buford Thomas. Wow. Now, my bride told me not to say this tonight. <laughs> but I've said this at every promotion and change of command since company command. Wow. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> so, you know, I know I'm batting clean up here tonight, and I really I want to congratulate uh, a space explorer and a Vietnam hero. And I'm extremely honored uh, to enter to, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame period, but extremely, extremely honored to be uh, inducted with Jeff and Bob. So God bless you guys for your service, your bravery, your accomplishments and achievements, and thanks for paving the way for the rest of us. So I was a little bit concerned about batting cleanup. How long were the other guys going to talk? And I've often said, never give a general or a chaplain the microphone, because you can never tell how long they will talk. <laughs> but Brother Sonny, you did a good job tonight. Thank you, sir. And it's a privilege to have uh, my good friend Sonny Moore and the honorary aviation branch chaplain give the invocation tonight. So God bless you, Sonny. We're blessed that you're here. So I'm truly, truly humbled to be here tonight. Uh, this is beyond my wildest dreams. It's a distinct honor. And again, it, it's a bit overwhelming. I'm a bit starstruck here this evening. I see so many familiar faces and folks who played a significant role in shaping who I am today. Well, you will only hear me say five names tonight. I think many of you will recognize your role the role you played in my life, from my brief comments and maybe some of the photos that were shown tonight. So I apologize in advance if I don't say your name, but I'm here because of you. I learned a long time ago that it's a lot better to retract good people who make you look better than you most often deserve. So first, first person I'll name, I want to thank my escort, Command Sergeant Major Buford Thomas. He is the best soldier I've ever known. And we shared a unique experience leading that battalion that uh, David Hartman talked about in the days immediately following 9-11. That was a journey, quite a journey quite a journey and a formative uh, experience in my career, and I could not have done it without Buford Thomas as my right arm. If today, given a no-fail task and the ability to build a team, Command Sergeant Major Buford Thomas would always be my first pick. Thank you for escorting me, Sergeant Major. And thank you for your tireless support and service and all you've done for our soldiers for so many years. I started this Army aviation journey as a young kid, thrilled to be on the team and committed to doing my best and making a difference. And oh, what a ride it has been. As I survey the audience, I see childhood heroes, West Point classmates, and many, many soldiers of all ranks with whom I've had the distinct privilege to serve with, for, and alongside. Collectively, you share the credit or the blame for me standing here tonight. You taught me. 
You took risks on me. You hired me. You led me. You followed me. You hired me again. You gave me the freedom to succeed in ever more challenging positions of responsibility and command. You humored me. You tolerated me. You challenged me. You hired me yet again. You sponsored me. You promoted me. Most importantly, though, you trusted me. You trusted me to lead our nation's treasures, treasure, your sons and daughters. You trusted me to lead your branch. You trusted me to do the right thing, whether it was leading you or following you. And on most days, you just plain inspired me to be the best I could be, the best soldier, pilot, leader, follower, husband, and citizen. So collectively, I thank you. I stand here today, a not-so-young kid who was thrilled to serve on your team, who did and is doing his best to add value and make a difference, and am the result of a lifetime of shaping by you and those like you, Army Aviation Soldiers. Before I close, there are four more folks I need to thank. This is the hard part. Of course, my late mother and father. I just think my mom might be a little bit proud And of, and of course, my dad, who is a rock star in aviation in his own right. And tomorrow night, I'll have the opportunity to pin his quad A 60-year member pin on him at the concert. Dad, I did as good as I could do, like you and Mom taught me. The jury's still out, but I think I'm doing OK. I want to thank my beautiful and very capable daughter, Anela, who will attend law school this fall. Anela, always, always remember that you are amazing just the way you are. I'm very proud of you and look forward, forward to watching you make your difference in this world, and there's no doubt a difference you will make. To my rock and the love of my life, my beautiful angel, baby, I would catch a grenade for you. <laughs> I would not be here without your support, counsel, leadership, genuine care and concern for our soldiers and families, and most importantly, your love and your patience. I'm very excited to spend the rest of my life with you. I can't wait. In closing, please, please never forget our heroes who gave their last full measure of devotion and service to our nation, making the ultimate sacrifice. And please pray for those troopers in harm's way this evening as we enjoy fine food, fine drink, and fine company. May they return home safely to their loved ones very soon when their mission is complete. Thanks again for this tremendous honor. It's beyond my wildest dream, and, and I would have never imagined this. Nice stalkers don't quit. Valeri Optimos, above the best. Thank you. God bless you.
And here to help Jen Mangum celebrate are his wife, Angel, his daughter, Anella Mangum, and her friend, First Lieutenant uh, Seamus Murray, his father, Colonel Retired Robert Mangum, and many close friends in the audience at different tables. Please stand and be recognized. That concludes my part of this evening. Thank you again for the honor of being here to share this evening honoring these three remarkable Patriot Americans. Thank you all very much. Thank you again, David. We appreciate everything that you've done for us tonight and through all the uh, unwavering, dedicated, personal time that you uh, give to us and recognize our heroes and what an impact you've had, not just on Army Aviation, but aviation in general across this country and your nation. And you should be justifiably proud. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you can imagine, there are many, many people it takes to put this together. We owe our thanks to so many in Army Aviation Hall of Fame salute our class of 2018 inductees. Thanks to John Fishback, our video producer, for all his coordination and support, and the whole Quad A team, along with Janice Arena, who takes such great care of our awardees at Hall of Fame inductees. Thank you all for coming. I also thank you for your attendance this evening, for your continued outstanding support of the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. On behalf of all its members, you have our deep gratitude for support and recognition. Please mark your calendars for the 27th Hall of Fame induction ceremony, which we'll hold here again in Nashville, Tennessee, on Thursday night, April 23rd, 2020. I certainly ask that all this evening's inductees remain for a few minutes after our program closes here for pictures, and so we can make some more photos. Meanwhile, please give our Hall of Fame inductees, another round of applause. Okay. Thank you all. We're looking to make Country Music Awards a second place attended event in Nashville, Tennessee. Please join us again next year and have a great evening.